Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the sixth episode of the story in which Naruto is adopted at a young age. How far can he go if someone actually supports him? How will he influence the elemental nations? This story is from a riding bunny. Please support him, her. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. This is going to be a cats and dogs fight, remarked one of the spectators. Hannah's sensitive hearing picked it even over the roar of the crowd. She smirked. The man was right. It was going to be a cats and dogs fight and she was itching to show the arrogant cat boy just which one of them was better. The Hymera triplets barked in anticipation. They couldn't wait to chase some cats as well. Akira on the other side of the stadium was having similar thoughts. He was more than ready to pound some mangy mutts into their place. Kiratsu meowed in agreement. He was trembling with excitement as well. They were going to pound the arrogant Inazuka to the ground, no matter they had the numerical advantage. For times nothing was still nothing, while they were mighty shinobi of the sand. The two, or six in their opinion, combatants stood in the middle of the arena, both snarling, the Inazuka growling and the Kaneko hissing. The proctor glanced to make sure they were prepared, then signaled for the match to begin and vacated the arena. Hana didn't waste a second, activating the Shikyaku no Jutsu before the sand from Marushi Shunshin settled down. She immediately gained a feral appearance. Her opponent followed suit with his family version of beast mimicry technique. His eyes turned slitted like a cat's, his ears become pointed, his teeth grew longer and sharper and his nails turned into sharp claws, his hair now resembling a lion's mane. The two opponents now looked eerily similar, despite one sporting canine and the other feline traits. The dog mistress attacked first. She started forward to engage the cat master in a taijutsu battle, her dogs meanwhile attacking the overgrown black cat. Hannah's charge was fast and ferocious, but the Kaneko clan transformation ensured him superior speed. He evaded her attack without even trying and slashed his claws at her. She blocked with her forearm, but the sharp thin nails pierced her skin anyway. She bared her teeth in a threatening grimace and kicked at his legs. He jumped over her shin and tried to punch her face. She turned her head to avoid it. The exchange of blows continued for another minute. Then the kunoichi jumped back and disengaged. So far she discovered that her opponent was bigger, stronger and faster than her, though his taijutsu skill wasn't superior, he was maintaining the upper hand in this combat. Even the Hymer siblings weren't faring too well, they were still young and the cat seemed fully grown. Kuratsum was throwing them around. It was time to step up the fight. She withdrew four soldier pills from her pouch and threw three of them to her partners. The puppies grew in size and they fur darkened. She swallowed the last one herself. She could already feel the energy filling her veins. All right, boys, she called, let's go wild. Jujin Bunshin. The three canines were enveloped in clouds of chakra. When they dispersed, for exact copies of Inazuka Hana were standing there, all of them growling threateningly. Gatsuga. Four flurry tornadoes sped towards Akira. He was moving before they could get halfway to him. It stretched the limits of his speed, but he managed to get out of their way. They changed their direction to follow him, but couldn't maneuver properly at such speed. Then he realized something. Their charge at him was only a feint. Their real target had been Kuratsum all the time. They guessed which way he would dodge and used the pretense of going after him to hide their true intentions. The moment they were revealed it was already too late. The great panther spotted the danger heading his way and with feline grace sprang to evade. He almost made it. One of the Tsuga caught his flank cutting a long gash into it. It hardly went any deeper than skin, but it hurt nevertheless. He roared in pain. The Inazuka foursum stopped their spins and looked at the results of their ploy. The cat was bleeding slightly, but it sustained no debilitating injury. But then she never expected to take him out with the first charge. 
Kiratsum, Akira shouted furiously. That bitch dared to touch his precious cat. She'll pay for that dearly, he was going to see to that. He took out his own soldier pills and threw one to his partner. The panther swallowed it and undergone his own transformation. It seemed to grow, its eyes glowed golden and its fur gained a reddish sheen. Come on, shouted Akira. Kaneko style, the Sphinx. Swirling chakra surrounded the pair. Hannah knew that whatever would come out of it wouldn't be good for her, but she was too slow to stop it. The whirl of chakra died down revealing something from ancient legends. The being's lower half of the body belonged to a great feline, resembling Kiratsum but much bigger. Where the neck and head should be was instead a human torso, larger than it should be, but the face undoubtedly belonged to Akira. The dog mistress had no idea what the creature could do, but she decided she didn't want to find out. She called her dogs to her. In Azuka style, Nibai so too row. She joined with one of her dogs, the remaining two joined together. Soon there were two big double-headed wolves facing the cat-like monster. Let's go, the one on the right growled. They charged at the enemy. The cat ninja weren't waiting idly for them to come. The sphinx reached into his utility pouch, which he retained during the jutsu, and took out a ceiling scroll. With a puff of smoke a monstrous halberd appeared in his hands. The charging wolves changed directions just in time to avoid being pierced through. This wasn't going to be easy, but she already knew that. She paused for a moment to think. The Kaneko capitalized on it instantly. He jumped forward, his weapon poised to strike. She narrowly avoided the sharp point, then tried to grab the pole with one of her heads. The feline beast noticed it and withdrew his weapon. Her jaws snapped empty. She was now inside his guard. She jumped forward. To grab his shoulder. He jumped backwards. She pursued him. He swung his halberd at her. It sliced into her side. She yelped in pain and grabbed it with her jaws. He tried to take it back, but her teeth held fast. The other head barked an order. The Kaneko had barely time to look over his shoulder, when the other so too row went into a garuga. He let go of his weapon and jumped to avoid it, but he couldn't match the speed of the wolf's fang. It slammed into his side. It then proceeded to throw him into the air and slam him into the arena wall. Their landing threw up a huge cloud of dust. When it cleared, it revealed Akira, Kuratsum and two of the Hymera triplets lying on the ground. Small whimpers could be heard from the downed group. Akira tried to move, he managed to rise to his hands and knees, but Hannah, still in the double-headed wolf form, was upon him in an instant, closing her jaws around him. The sharp points of her teeth digging into his skin stressed the hopelessness of his situation. I yield, he whimpered through clenched teeth. He couldn't believe he lost to some mangy mutt, but he couldn't deny the reality of the mouth threatening to slice him into three pieces at the slightest provocation, not to mention that half of the bones in his body felt broken. Winner, Inazuka Hana, announced the proctor. The kunoichi immediately separated from her dog. The technique took the majority of her chakra. She would be at great disadvantage in the upcoming fight, she could only hope her next opponent would be even worse off after his first fight. She refused to let any weakness show on her and left the arena followed by her faithful dogs. She'll have to sacrifice even more of her precious chakra to heal them before the next fight. It occurred to her that she might have to forfeit, but her pride prevented her from doing so. She definitely was going to fight, even if she should lose within the first minute. Spectator stands, wow, Kiba exclaimed. You rock, sister. Excellent, Hannah, some shouted. You showed him up. She was glad her daughter beat up the arrogant Kaneko. Their clans had a grudge against each other since before the founding of the hidden villages. It wasn't anything major, just some rivalry sprouting from the natures of cats and dogs. She turned to Kiba. So you see how important it's to train? Yes, he nodded. 
So when will I get my dog? Or can I get three like Hannah? Or four? You wouldn't know how to handle one, Karamura remarked. That's right, his mistress nodded. You can't get a partner until you prove you can handle one. Ah, uh, mom, Kiba pouted. I can handle one. I don't think so, she shook her head resolutely. That's not fair, he complained. Life's not fair, Karamura turned his only eye to him. Get used to it. Kage Booth, a lot of power in the both of them, but two short tempers for Chunin, the Tsuchikage said. I remember the Kaneko losing his composure, but when exactly did the Inazuka do anything rash? the Hokage asked. You mean except the beginning, when she charged a bigger, stronger opponent? the Kazakage asked. She was angry the whole time and it clouded her judgment. She wasted lots of chakra here. She showed more strategy than her opponent did, Sarutobi pointed out. But not enough. Finalists booth, way to go, Hana. Naruto shouted. Even he was amazed that his teammate could fight so well. He had seen so two row only once before and never two of them at once. He considered it impressive even back then, but now it was a completely different show. It's quite something, isn't it? Hataru agreed. I can't believe Akira lost, Mizu shook her head. Now it's up to you to save the honor of our team, Tashiro said. Even he came here as soon as he managed to escape the infirmary. Don't even remind me she grimaced. Nightmarish images of what Yuka-sensei would do if all of them lost in the first round entered her consciousness. Despite the hot day she shivered. She needed something to take her mind of such depressing matters. Hey, you purple wench, she turned to Hataru, I'm going to kick you until your own mom won't be able to recognize you. You wish, Hataru smirked. I bet you're going to trip over your braids. What's up with them anyway? What serious Kunoichi can let her hair grow that long? And what about you? Mizu shot back. How much do you spend on hair dyes? And have you forgotten your clothes today? Hataru growled. Nobody insulted her hair. Uh, girls, Naruto said. Shouldn't you keep it for the duel? Sure enough, the proctor called. Fifth match of the quarterfinals, Yuzuki Hataru of Kanoha vs. Miju of Suna. The girls scowled at each other once more before heading downstairs. The arena floor Hataru was secretly glad her opponent for the first round was a girl. Even though she became confident in her abilities during the last half year, most of the competitors still looked too tough for her to beat. But the girl with the ridiculously long hair looked like she could be a relatively easy opponent. Of course, Tenzo-sensei had beaten into their heads that appearances are often deceiving, but she still felt optimistic about her first duel. The other Kunoichi casually strolled into the arena, her four long braids adorned with strange ornaments at the end swinging behind her. Ready to lose, she taunted. You stole my words, returned Hataru. So sure of yourself, pretty girl, the Suna Kunoichi sniped. Look who's talking. The purple clad girl scoffed. Ready? the proctor asked before the verbal fight could escalate. Both Kunoichi nodded. Begin, he said and vacated the arena. Hataru drew her sword. Miju did the same. The Kanoha Genin looked curiously at her weapon. The blade looked weird, too wide to have a real edge. What trick was there to it? The two opponents eyed each other warily for several seconds. Then Hataru lost patience and charged. Miju. Prepared to counter her. When the purple-haired girl got close enough, she struck. Hataru first couldn't understand why the other girl moved so soon. She was still far outside her reach. Then her strange sword started unfolding. Hataru's eyes widened. If she tried to block the attack, the blade would just go around her and hit her from behind. She jumped high to avoid the blow, but the snake-like blade moved to follow her. Out of the corner of her eye she noticed her opponent smirking. That wasn't good. 
she twisted in the air. She managed to kick the flat side of the blade before it could slice her. The tip of the sword turned to pierce her back, but she blocked it with her own blade. She was almost on top of the other girl, ready to kick her face. Then her hair came into life. What the was the only thought in Hataru's head before the braid swung at her, the trinkets on them suddenly looking dangerous instead of ornamental. She couldn't halt her descent now. Miju thought she had her opponent, but then she suddenly turned into a rock, one of those that remained from an earlier match. Kawarimi, she realized. She barely had time to jump out of the way. She swore and turned around to search for her opponent. She didn't have to look for long. The purple-haired Kanoha Kunoichi was already running at her, her kodachi crackling with lightning chakra. The Suna Genin swung her strange weapon at her. Hataru blocked. The blades met with a crack of electricity. Hataru hoped it would shock her opponent, but she didn't even flinch. The handle must be insulated. This called for a different approach. She lifted her hands to form a sequence of seals. Right on, wide strike. Lightning bolts launched from her fingertips, heading in the general direction of her opponent. Realizing she couldn't dodge in time, she pulled a kawarimi. Hataru's attack scorched only a boulder. Seeing this she quickly moved from her spot. It proved to be a wise decision, Miju attacked from behind. The leaf kunoichi considered her options. The bending sword sure was pesky. It prevented her from moving close and she wasn't particularly skilled at distance fighting. She'd have to take that weapon from her, the only question was how. An idea formed in her mind, she only needed time to make it work. She created a group of basic bunshin and had them attack the Suna girl. She let Miju to figure out whether they were corporeal or not on her own and quickly dug into her equipment pouch. She pulled out a roll of ninja wire and started tying it to Kanai. Tenzo's words about always being prepared resounded in her head. It wasn't that she was unmindful of them, she just never used that kind of weaponry before. She wasn't much good with it anyway, but now it seemed like it was her only option. Miju finally realized she was fighting illusions and that her opponent was preparing something. She decided to stop her before she could finish. Hataru saw her charge. It came sooner than she hoped, but not before she readied six of her kunai. She stood up and threw the first of them. Miju moved only slightly to evade. Hataru launched her other weapons. Miju came within range and unleashed her snake-like sword. Hataru pulled on the wires. The long blade was closing on her dangerously, but then it was stopped. The wires bound themselves around it. Miju swore. Hataru pulled and tried to take the weapon, but Miju's grip was unrelenting. Then she noticed something and had to prevent a smirk from appearing on her face. She sent a pulse of lightning chakra into the wires. It ran along them and into the other girl's hand that was touching the guard now. Miju screamed. Her muscles spasmed and tightened around the handle. She didn't lose the grip on her sword, but her hand became useless for the moment. Hataru saw the opportunity and capitalized on it. She grabbed her kodachi and attacked. Even one-handed the San Genin was far from defenseless. Her braids moved once more, assuming protective position in front of her. Hataru prepared to bat them away. A slight whistle of air warned her of danger coming from behind. She swerved to the left, but the tip of the bending blade still caught her in the side. How? she thought startled. She resumed her charge. She was almost atop the other girl. The four braids and folding blade were in defensive positions, but she wasn't deterred. Her own sword was filled with lightning chakra. She swung it and released the electricity in one bolt. At such a close range the Suna Kunoichi couldn't even think of dodging. Her hair moved to protect her, but did her little good. The bolt struck dead on. Miju crumpled on the ground. Hataru jumped in to land the finishing blow, mindful of common mission mishap number four, 
supposedly knocked out enemy isn't really out of the game yet. The lesson had proven too true again. Her sword strike was blocked by the bending blade. Miju was shocked and burned, but still not out of the fight. Hataru kicked her in the stomach. Miju skidded across the sandy ground. Hataru pressed her advantage, raising her kodachi for another strike. The long-haired girl shook off the worst effects of the lightning strike. She still had trouble moving, but she could manipulate her weapons. She sent her braids to hit Hataru's legs, but the purple-haired girl jumped over them. But she still had one last defense left. Her left hand formed a seal and held her breath. The ornaments adorning her braids let out a cloud of reddish smoke. The Kanoha Kunoichi noticed what she was doing and held her own breath. She landed next to her opponent and kicked her in the head. Miju slumped on the ground unconscious. Hataru then quickly vacated the gas-filled area. The proctor appeared and briefly examined the downed combatant. Winner, Yuzuki Hataru. She was so relieved. She came dangerously close to losing on too many occasions. She thanked the applauding audience and stumbled out of the arena. The fight wasn't long, but it had taken a lot out of her. She sustained a wound and she barely defeated what was one of the weakest competitors. Even the squirt Naruto didn't have so much trouble with his opponent. Once again she felt doubts about her ability. Kage Booth, interesting fighting style the Suna girl has, the Hokage observed. I have seen attempts at using puppetry techniques in close combat before, but none quite like this. But she lost, the Kazakage spat. It was a bitter pill to swallow. Out of the five Suna genin whose fights already took place only one had advanced. It was unacceptable. He could only hope that the last one would fare better. Behind the esteemed village leaders one of Hokage's ANBU guards smiled behind her mask. She knew her cousin had it in her, she had trained with her often enough. Her stance betrayed nothing of her thoughts. She was a professional after all. Finalists Booth, damn it, Toshiro swore to no one in particular. Akira was still in the infirmary. All his team was out and none of them had even put a spectacular fight. Yuka-sensei was going to train them to the ground for this. Awesome, Hataru. Naruto cheered wildly. He had a good reason. They were the only team that advanced as a whole. None of the others could boast the same. It was just too bad he had nobody to share his joy with. Hannah was still somewhere healing her wounded dogs. A pity she couldn't witness this fight. Down in the arena, the sixth match of the quarterfinals, Marushi called, Kuratsuchi of IWA against Ayum Daiki of Suna. Kuratsuchi strolled into the arena with a sway. Her opponent was a short, wimpy-looking boy in loose robe-like outfit in bluish color, looking utterly harmless. The Tsuchikage's granddaughter wasn't fooled though. She cultivated the useless image herself, with her bright red top and miniskirt and mesh leggings, and many enemies had fallen victim to the dangerous deception. She was convinced that despite his appearance her opponent was quite capable. Too bad she had no idea what he specialized in. She could make a guess though. He didn't seem to have a lot of weapons on his person, despite the concealing garb. His attire also wasn't overly practical for taijutsu, so that left ninjutsu and genjutsu. She tried to recall everything she knew about his family. Being from Akage's family gave her considerably better access to information than was usual among genin. The Ayum were a small clan from Suna, not prominent. Little was known about their specific abilities, they tended to use general ninja skills, usually being proficient with genjutsu. She reckoned that was this one's style of choice as well. If it was so, things were looking good for her. She was quite adept at detecting and dispelling them and not too bad at casting them either. She had no problem looking confident and intimidating. When the proctor signaled the beginning of the match, she immediately charged. If the Suna boy was indeed a Genjutsu specialist, 
there was no use giving him time to ensnare her in one of his illusions. The boy darted out of the way. That wasn't too good, he observed. His voice had a strange sing-song quality to it. She turned on her heel and charged at him again, this time throwing a few shuriken for good measure. He evaded easily again. Is this all you can do? he taunted. You haven't seen anything yet, she snarled. That baby-faced sissy boy was seriously pissing her off. Eyes narrowed, she took a moment to consider which jutsu would be best to squash him. Have you fallen asleep? She was seriously fed up with his jabs. She was going to wipe that arrogant smirk from his face. Dotan, giant's hands. Her fingers flickered through required hand seals and a giant stone hand rose from the ground, trying to grab the Suna Jenin's legs and squash them. He noticed the danger in time and jumped away, just as she expected him to. Another hand appeared. It managed to touch his ankle before he turned into a boulder. What? she thought, then some instinct warned her about danger behind her. She jumped to the side and Daiki's kunai narrowly missed her. Damn, a kawarimi, she thought. How comes I haven't noticed it earlier? That was pathetic, the blue-clad boy snickered. She answered with a hail of shuriken. He dodged, but she used wires attached to them to change their course. They hit him and passed right through. Bunshin? Genjutsu? I must be slipping, thought the IWA Kunoichi. Kai? she tried the dispelling technique. Nothing changed. What? She couldn't understand. Is the illusion so complex or is there none at all? You look confused, Daiki observed with mirth. She whirled around. She was going to rip him a new one. A part of her mind noted that she didn't even detect him until he spoke. She paid it no heed. With a hand seal she forced the earth to form a spike and impale the pest. He disappeared with a burst of smoke. Another bunshin? She couldn't believe her eyes. He was leading her around. How dare he? When she got her hands on him. A part of her brain pointed out that she would first have to get her hands on him and that would be quite difficult if she couldn't find him. She had to admit that it was true. What are you doing? Striking at thin air, the obnoxious kid jibed again. Her face twisted into a snarl. How dare he? How does he make me so angry anyway? I don't usually react to taunts like that. Scratch it, I never do. So why does he? And how is he hiding? Genjutsu perhaps? Kai, she attempted dispelling again. Nothing changed around her but she felt a bit calmer. I was right, he is doing something to me, she realized, but how? I've never heard about a genjutsu like this. Doesn't work, does it? The Suna sand rat sing-songed and she once again saw red. She whirled around, already halfway through the seal sequence for a devastating earth jutsu. His voice, she realized. Every time he speaks, I get angrier. He. Already made me waste lots of chakra. I mustn't allow it to continue. Kai, she said for the third time during the duel. It helped a little bit. Seriously, what are you trying to accomplish? And she was back where she started. It was getting irritating, but she barely noticed through her fury. I have to stay focused, the rational part of her mind commanded, but it was too hard to obey. Can't you talk? I mustn't listen to him. I mustn't listen to him, she repeated like a mantra. It helped her a bit, but Daiki was pressing his advantage. You IWA Neen are really as thick as rocks. Kai, she tried again, even though she knew it was an exercise in futility. She put her fingers to her ears. I won't listen to you anymore, she shouted. But that isn't so easy, is it? He called back. Damn it, he was still influencing her. And she had no idea where was he hiding. There was only one thing she could do now. She had learned the technique only recently and still wasn't proficient enough with it, but she was confident she could pull it off. 
Dotan, Stone Rose Garden. Earthen vines sprouted from the ground in a wide circle around Kuratsuchi, most of them having sharp thorns. The rock Kunoichi swore. She couldn't cover the whole arena with them and only about half of them were fully formed. Looks like I'll have to practice more, she thought. Fortunately for her the jutsu fulfilled its purpose. Her slippery opponent suddenly appeared jumping from a spot well within the technique's range, a bloody tear in his pants leg. Got you, that Tsuchikage's granddaughter thought. Her hands formed a seal, but nothing visible happened. Daiki landed in the ground and sunk into it. His eyes widened in surprise. Checkmate, thought the black-haired girl and her face twisted into a predatory smirk. Then she wavered a bit. This had cost her more chakra than she expected. She had to finish this manually then. It shouldn't be too much of a problem, her opponent was buried up to his waist in the ground and not going anywhere. Well, that's a bother, the Ayum stated. Yes, it was a bother, she agreed silently. She would finish it quickly. She reached into her pouch for a couple of kunai. Aren't you tired? the blue-gray clad boy asked. Yes, she was tired. She must have burned even more chakra than she had initially thought. She had to finish it soon. I'm so tired as well, he added. Or maybe she could take a nap now and finish it later. Or maybe he's using his voice again, she realized, but she was so tired she didn't care. But then her eyes caught sight of the kage box where her grandfather was sitting. No, she couldn't lose here. Not in front of him. Not when her dimwit of a brother had already won. He would never let her hear the end of it. She summoned whatever willpower she still possessed. Kai, she said for what felt like thousandth time today and instantly felt better. She hauled her kanai at the San Genin. That should shut him up. Despite being trapped, Daiki managed to avoid most of the projectiles and the others he deflected with a kanai of his own. Kuratsuchi ran at him top speed. With every step her fatigue was lessening. He stood no chance now. The Suna ninja refused to accept that. He brought his hands together in a seal. The Kunoichi threw another handful of kanai at him to prevent him from finishing whatever jutsu he was preparing. She wasn't fast enough. A sense of vertigo suddenly hit her and she stumbled. When she looked back up, she saw rows and files of bluish-clad genin in front of her. But which one was the real one? She raised her hands into a dispelling sign. It is hopeless, her opponent said. You cannot break out of my illusions so easily. Her dispelling failed. It was bad. He had her ensnared and she couldn't. It's just a matter of time before you'll admit defeat. And he was speaking again. Damn it, why would I despair? He is the one buried in the ground. Kai, she shouted. This time it worked. Only one image remained in front of her. And now I've got you, she smirked evilly. She closed the distance between them in a few steps and plunged a kanai into his chest. She encountered no resistance. Not the real one. How? Am I in a layered genjutsu? So you see how futile your attempts are. The melodic voice of the Ayum clan member once again pierced her consciousness and filled her with a sense of hopelessness. She knew it was his doing, but it was hard not to succumb. You have nothing to counter my ability. Make that very hard. But there was something in her that refused to give up. No, she yelled and jumped to her feet. A sharp pain shot from her thigh. A kunai had sliced her skin. That's where my neck was a second before, she realized, cold running along her spine. She glanced around. She could now clearly see her opponent, his hand still raised after the throw. If I hadn't jumped. But she had and the pain had broken her out of the genjutsu. She wasted no more time. In one giant, adrenalinated leap she crossed the distance between them and kicked him, first to his stomach and then to his head. Hard. 
and then she kicked him again. He slumped to the ground unconscious. She kicked him once more for good measure. The proctor appeared beside her. He examined Daiki to make sure he was really out of it. Winner, Kuratsuchi, he announced. She sagged with relief. That fight had been draining, both physically and emotionally. She bowed to the audience, glancing at her grandfather to gauge his opinion of her fight, but that Tsuchikage's face was unreadable even for her. Well, she'll find out during the break. And she should check up on Akatsuchi as well. Kage's booth, the Ayum was in control of the fight until the end, the Kazakage said. He couldn't believe it. Out of the six Suna Genin only one advanced. That was just unacceptable. At least this one had made a good show of it until he messed it up. He could already see his budget. Dwindling. That he was, the Hokage agreed. If she hadn't moved when she did. I'd probably killed him, that Tsuchikich thought, consequences be damned. His grandchildren were most precious to him in the whole world. Even more precious than power. They were the only ones who could boast that. Spectators stands, your team is out, Yukakun, a woman in an expensive kimono smirked. It looked strange on her white painted face. It is so, Tiono chan, the man in tiger like suit answered. Their spirits shone brightly, but not enough. I will have to work with them long and hard to remedy it. Those poor dears, the geisha look alike commented. I don't understand how they put up with you. They know where they get the best training, he replied. Not everybody can get by only on their looks. Do you think you can take on me, she cooed. No, he said. Her flirtatious expression unnerved him. It never bode well for anybody. That's good, she nodded. The combs and needles in her elaborate hairdo jingled slightly. I like men who know who is their better. If you excuse me now, Yuku said, I'll go check on my students. Those poor dears need some cheering up, lest their spirits would dampen. I think I should go with you, Tiono decided. I have students to console as well. You aren't going to get rid of me so easily, Yuku-kun. There was a half-hour break between the quarterfinals and the semi-finals. Team Tenzo used it to meet together. They choose a place near the infirmary, because Hana was still tending to her dogs and Hataru had a couple of minor scraps that needed a bit of medical attention. Good work, all three of you, Tenzo beamed at his students. We're the most awesome team there is, Naruto boasted. Are you now? The Jounin cocked his head sideways. That's because we have the most awesome sensei, the boy added. The wood user couldn't help but smile. He ruffled Naruto's hair. Never forget it, he said. The infirmary Ryotenbin no Oonoki used the break to check on his grandchildren. He was proud that they both won, even though he thought they could have done better. He found them in the infirmary, a medic was just finishing his work on Akatsuchi's arm. There, the woman said, it should be all right now, but you should still try to avoid getting hit there. The redhead nodded in confirmation. I understand. It's not like I need two hands to squish a midget. That's the spirit, Kuratsuchi smiled. The Mednin left the room. There was a moment of tense silence. Neither of the genin knew whether their kage came to praise them or scold them. It was rarely possible to tell with him. Good job, the two of you, the grandfather said with a smile. The tense atmosphere immediately disappeared. It could be better, the boy remarked. I should have beaten that nobody sooner. Don't be too harsh on yourself, that Tsuchikic consoled him. You are elite in IWA, but those who got into the finals are elite in their own villages. You cannot expect to defeat them easily, that's a sure way to fail. I know, Akatsuchi answered. Then don't forget it, the old man advised. I won't, his grandson assured. I'll beat that child with no trouble. Now listen to yourself, brat, Oanoki chastised. What have I just told you? 
you're already underestimating him. That's what's he good at, Kuratsuchi added. Don't underestimate the boy, the Sandame Tsuchikage said gravely. Why so serious, his granddaughter wondered. That child, he looks just like him, the Kage answered. Him? Akatsuchi's eyes widened. Surely you don't mean him? Yes, you dolt, that's just who I mean, the short man said. Are you certain? the black-haired girl asked. What is ever certain? the aged village leader asked rhetorically. But we cannot afford to take chances. If Kanoha trains another fighter like him. He trailed of with a grave face. Once more silence ruled the infirmary. Everybody was considering the possible implications. The images they came up with weren't pretty. Akatsuchi, the Tsuchikage ordered, in the next match. Kill him. I will, the boy smirked evilly. And don't you dare underestimate him, Oanoki reminded him. There is something else I have to tell you about him. It isn't confirmed, but I suspect he is the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Kitsun. No way. That squirt? Akatsuchi didn't look convinced. Well, he is the right age, Kuratsuchi mused. And if that is true, what would happen if he used his power? Do you really think Akatsuchi can take him then? Then I must get him before he gets the chance to do so, the big redhead decided. Just be careful, the old man said. If things go bad, fall back. There are other ways to get rid of one little genin. But none of the others are legal, the redhead said. You caught on it quickly, his grandfather smiled. Maybe we'll make a diplomat out of you yet. Not likely, Kuratsuchi smirked. You aren't going to get a rise out of me, sister, Akatsuchi answered. I don't want to be a politician anyway. I'll be a strong ninja instead. Then why are you not? she teased. What did you just say? Children, that such a kid interrupted, spare the energy for your fights. And that's an order. The arena Marushi announced that the break was over. First match of the semi-finals, Uzumaki Naruto of Konoha vs Akatsuchi of IWA. Akatsuchi entered the arena with a heavy feeling in his stomach. Was it really possible? Could he really be facing the son of that man? It was almost too much to comprehend. And was he really a Jinchuriki? He didn't look like one. He knew both Han and Rushi in IWA and both were big hulks of man and accomplished shinobi. He realized they must have been young once, but it was still hard to imagine such power contained within such a small body. Of course, they might be reading too much into this situation and their likeness was entirely coincidental, but they would rather err on the side of caution, especially when the future of IWA was at stake. Especially when he could kill his target legally. Then the person in question stood right in front of him looking at him with big blue eyes from under golden yellow bangs. He was just a child, he realized, but he could very well be his son. The son of his father's killer. Yes, he would enjoy killing him. Naruto meanwhile was eyeing him warily. The IWA genin was twice as tall and four times as wide as him. That didn't bode well for him. The expression in the redhead's round face didn't bode well for him as well. For a moment he considered forfeiting. But then he looked up in the stands, to his teammates and sensei cheering on him. Another glance was aimed at the Kage booth. He couldn't see the Hokage's expression in the shadow cast by his hat, but he could imagine a gentle encouraging smile on that wrinkled old face. No, he couldn't let them down. He would fight. Suddenly his opponent being so big didn't look like such a bad thing. It just made him easier to hit. His confidence restored, he smiled. Ready? the proctor asked. Begin. He disappeared from the arena. The contestants stood there motionless, both measuring the other, both considering the best course of attack. Akatsuchi moved first. He decided to begin with the brutal approach. He ran at the Kanoha Genin intending to crush him. 
Naruto jumped to the side, grabbing his sword. He wanted to slice the IWA boy with a wind blade, but he was too slow. The redhead evaded the attack. Then the rotund youth whirled on his feet and charged again. The leaf ninja waited for the right moment to strike. The bigger lad didn't give him the opportunity. He hauled a fistful of shuriken at him and the youngest of the chunin hopefuls was forced to dodge again. The situation repeated once more, this time with Kanai sailing at the blonde genin. He evaded again, then noticed the Kanai handles. His eyes widened for a split second before he performed a kawarimi. He made it just in time to avoid the blast from the exploding notes activating. Are you going to run all the time? The round-faced Chunin hopeful taunted. Naruto thought about a witty reply for a moment but nothing suitable came to him. He decided to go on offense instead. He ran forward with his sword poised for a strike. When a stone wall suddenly rose from the earth, he wasn't surprised. He pumped chakra to his legs and jumped high. He knew the opponent would be prepared for him, but then, so was he. When the IWA ninja evaded his strike, he didn't even blink. He just turned his head a bit. Akatsuchi moved his fist to punch him. Naruto unleashed a slicing scream. The problem was his opponent had seen that technique in the first round. When he noticed the blonde opening his mouth, he was already ducking. The main force of the blast hit only thin air. Akatsuchi punched at him. Naruto kicked. His foot touched Akatsuchi's forearm, but he didn't manage to deflect the hit significantly. It impacted with his side and sent him crashing into the ground. He rolled on the ground. The IWA redhead kicked him, but the blonde switched with one of the boulders littering the battleground. He got to his feet and assessed the damage. Nothing serious. His side was sore, but that would fade soon. He wondered how his newest trick worked, but he couldn't see the other contestant from his spot. Then the Tsuchikage's grandson appeared from behind the stone wall. His right arm was bleeding and his face held a furious expression. Naruto smirked. It worked as a charm. Tenzo had been initially doubtful when he suggested enveloping any part of his body in wind chakra, but his student was convinced about the potential in his idea. It took a lot of training, but it was paying off. He hadn't perfected it yet but he could now turn his feet into blades. He was thankful for all the walking on anything lessons. Unfortunately he couldn't make the blades very long. It seemed that only skin was cut on Akatsuchi's forearm, but even that was better than nothing. He doubted the other boy could regenerate the same as him. And even the smallest sensitive spot can be exploited, his sensei had hammered the lesson into him mercilessly. Now he just had to get close to the other shinobi. But the rock ninja knew that as well and was dead set on not allowing it. The big boy raised his arms to form hand seals. Naruto mirrored his action. Two dozen shadow clones appeared in front of him the same time a rift appeared in the ground and sped towards him. The clones spread out. Akatsuchi couldn't tell which one was the original and cancelled his technique. He instead started another jutsu and stone spikes rose from the sand covering the arena floor. There were more numerous and sharper than when he used the jutsu before. About a half of Naruto's clones were popped. He signaled to the remaining ones. It was time for a jutsu combo. Eight of the clones started forming seals for a futon, great breakthrough, the others for katan, enden. But Akatsuchi wasn't idle as well. A quick series of hand seals and a palm slammed into the ground and a dome of earth formed around him. The inferno of Naruto's techniques couldn't get in. The blonde swore. His opponent had a counter to his strongest attack. That had cost him quite a lot of chakra and even his reserves weren't bottomless. He couldn't just fire a jutsu after jutsu and hope the other boy would reach his limit first. He reckoned the redhead's chakra was running low but he wasn't willing to bet the match on it. He had to think up a strategy. Akatsuchi was breathing hard. That had been close. 
he could feel the heat from the flames even through the earth wall. He didn't even want to think about what would have happened had he been a second slower. Not to mention a thorough defense like this cost him a whole lot of chakra. He couldn't afford to let this fight drag on. He had to finish it in one move. He had already revealed his trump card in the duel with the Shinkadai boy, the yellow brat wouldn't fall for it, he had already proven himself quick with the Kawarimi. He had to try something else. He formed a couple of rock clones. Naruto watched cracks appear in the molten glassy surface of the dome. The Dotan user was about to come out. He and his remaining clones moved closer to get a better position for an attack. Then the overgrown boy finally appeared and Naruto struck. His blade was sharpened with elemental chakra, closing in at the rotund boy's stomach. The Kanoha genin wasn't aiming to kill, but he was still surprised how shallow the resulting wound was. More so when the big redhead didn't even flinch and struck him in the face. A rock clone realized the boy before he dispersed into smoke. The original Naruto grimaced. He could have figured that Tsuchikage's grandson would know those. He recalled everything he knew about them. Tenzo used them in training often enough for him to gain some experience. They were strong and hard to destroy, but they had little intelligence of their own, usually they required their creator's direct control. Now how to use it to his advantage? He knew the original IWA Genin was still inside the dome, but the doppelganger was blocking his access. There was no way he could pass through the wall of moving stone. Then he slapped his forehead. There was an obvious answer to the problem. Without wasting any more time he proceeded to implement it. Akatsuchi glanced through the hole in the wall. His clone was doing well in fending any of the blonde's attacks off, but he wasn't getting any closer to killing the pest. He sent the other clone to battle. He'd let them do the hard work and use the brief respite to recuperate. Then the little yellow menace decided to attack. A hail of kunai sailed from one of the still remaining shadow clones. He motioned for his own rock clone to block them. It managed without trouble. Next came a wave of shuriken. Even those were easily stopped. He glanced to the side. He could have sworn something moved there but he couldn't tell what it was. Still he couldn't just let it pass. It could be a trap. He wasn't given enough time to investigate. Numerous kanai were flying at him and this time there was the telltale burning of explosive notes. He sacrificed a good part of his remaining chakra to create a wall to stop them. This was becoming too troublesome. An explosion resounded outside. It couldn't harm him inside. The punch he barely blocked with his forearm could. How the hell did he get inside, thought the IWA Genin. And why did he have to hit the arm injured during the first clash, followed closely. Akatsuchi had to suppress a pained gasp. His eyes narrowed in anger. He was going to pound the obnoxious piece of snot into the ground and then some. He punched with all his might. Naruto barely avoided the crushing fist. He suddenly got second thoughts about his plan. Sure. The transformation along with distractions enabled him to get close to his opponent, but after he failed to take him out with the first strike, he found himself in an extremely unfavorable position. There wasn't enough space to dodge. His sword was lying discarded somewhere in the sand. He couldn't see outside to find something to perform a kawarimi with. And to top it off, the other boy seemed intent on breaking every bone in his body. He realized he was fighting not for promotion, but for his very life here. Akatsuchi struck again and this time Naruto's attempt to dodge was stopped by the wall. He groaned in pain. He tried to use a slicing scream, but a kick to his ribs forced the air out of him before he could lace it with chakra. Yes, things were indeed looking bad for him. He wished he went for the kill the moment he got into the dome, but it was too late for it and idle musings at such a time would only get him killed. I can't die here, he thought. Before he could come up with a way to prevent it, another hit landed on his head. Stars exploded in front of his eyes. Kill him, 
said a voice. Yes, he answered. The stars were suddenly gone. He could see perfectly within the darkness of the dome. A fist was nearing him again. He raised his arms and blocked. Surprise registered on his opponent's round face. He used the brief reprieve to get to his feet. The IWA Jenin quickly shook off his surprise. He reached into his pouch for a kunai. The Jinchuriki snarled in response. He jumped at the redhead. He blocked the vicious kick, but the force of the impact propelled the bigger boy backwards nevertheless. Disbelief was written all over his face. It didn't stay there for long. He stabbed his kunai at the short yellow menace. Naruto moved just a bit, avoiding the blade by a hair's breadth. He slammed into the other boy's large stomach. He stumbled backward, through the crack, knocking over the wall he erected to block the exploding kunai. Naruto jumped after him and punched. His fist hit hard rock. His opponent pulled a kawarimi. Then a stony fist impacted with his ribcage, sending him flying. He had completely forgotten about the rock clones and now he was paying for it. He rolled for a moment before pulling a kawarimi on his own. He took a moment to assess his situation. It didn't look well. His ribs were aching and his whole body was burning, but not due to the demon's chakra. That short rush had left him about the same time they exited the earth dome. It was just sheer exhaustion. For a moment he considered yielding, but then the ground under his feet moved. He didn't have time for thinking anymore, he only reacted. Akatsuchi was having similar thoughts. He as well was injured and exhausted, but he couldn't stop. Not when his grandfather, his Kage, had entrusted him with a mission. Not when he saw firsthand just how dangerous the small child in front of him was. He gathered his remaining chakra to begin a maneuver that would ensure his victory and death of the little pest. Naruto jumped up as soon as he felt the ground shift. He didn't get neither high nor far. The soil disappearing from under his feet prevented it. I should switch with something, occurred to him, but before he could turn the thought into deed the ground suddenly appeared again, trapping his feet. The Kawarimi failed. Akatsuchi swore. He had intended to fully bury his opponent, but his chakra supply had ran out on him and the disappearing ground technique ended too soon. He could have guessed it by its slow start, it was the only thing that allowed the other genin to jump at all. But it didn't matter now. The Kanoha child was trapped. Lack of chakra didn't matter anymore. He'll finish him off with his bare hands. Scratch it, he'll take a kanai to make sure. Naruto was thinking frantically. He was stuck and something in the ground surrounding his feet prevented him from getting out. He tried cutting the rock, but even wind-sharpened blades couldn't do more than put a dent into it. His back was unprotected. His clones had already been destroyed by Akatsuchis, but, on a positive note, the two rock clones were now lying on the ground motionless. It still left the original to attack him. He created two shadow clones to cover his back, but he knew they wouldn't last long against the Tsuchikage's grandson. Exhaustion was setting into his bones. No matter how he thought about it, he was screwed. It didn't even occur to him he could yield. The fact that this was just a competition was forgotten somewhere along the way. Now it was a death match. Russell of Sand betrayed his opponent's approach. He tried to look, but he couldn't turn fully with his legs bound by the Dotan technique. He saw over his shoulder how the clones attacked with slicing scream and then dispersed. Their chakra supply had run out. The redhead was forced to dodge and suffered a few cuts, but soon he was coming at him again. Naruto gathered his chakra to his hands and turned it into the wind element. He still couldn't make a long blade, but it wouldn't matter if his opponent came close enough. If he came from an angle he could hit him at all. Akatsuchi realized that as well. He changed his course to always come at the blonde's back. The trapped genin turned left and right, but he still couldn't face him fully. And then the overgrown redhead came within range. 
Naruto stabbed with his left hand, but he only glanced one of the giant's thighs. Akatsuchi aimed for his neck. He bent forward to avoid a lethal hit. The kunai plunged deep between his ribs. It didn't hurt. He knew that it should, but there was only the coldness of the steel piercing too close to his heart. He opened his mouth half in surprise, half in silent scream. Then pain suddenly hit him as the blade was slowly retracted from his body. Red clouded his vision. He turned with speed he didn't know he possessed and struck the enemy just as he was preparing for another stab. The huge youth flew back and hit the arena wall with a crack. He slumped on the ground unconscious. Naruto forcibly freed his feet from the trap. The chakra enforcing the soil couldn't withstand the strong flow of Kyuubi's yuki. Some small part of Naruto's brain realized that it was flowing through his body almost as strongly as during his fight with Gara. The rest didn't care. He simply wanted to tear apart the insect that dared to try to kill him. Yes, resounded in his consciousness. Naruto. It came from an incredible distance. He wanted to ignore it, but something told him it was important. Who was calling him anyway? He noticed his sensei jumping into the arena. What was he doing here? The match. That's right, the match. He was fighting the second round of the Chunin exam finals. His opponent was lying on the ground unmoving, bleeding. He had won. He didn't need to kill him. Why did he even want to anyway? He had almost given in to the demon. He concentrated his will and forced the red chakra to recede back into the seal. Tenzo didn't even have to use his trees. The blonde slumped to his knees. He clutched at his chest. It hurt, but the demon's power had already worked its magic. The wound closed. He felt tired. There were strong arms encircling him, hugging him to somebody's chest. Tenzo, he realized. Somebody appeared nearby. The proctor. He barely heard Marushi declare him the winner. Darkness was already gnawing at the edges of his vision. He had the vague sensation of being lifted and carried. Then even that disappeared. He finally fainted. Kage Booth Oenoki couldn't believe what he was seeing. His grandson, his precious little Akatsuchi, was slumped on the ground, for deep gashes across his chest. He wanted to jump down to the arena, to help his boy, to slay that monster that had hurt, killed, him, to make sure that a blonde devil of Kanoha wouldn't hurt another of his people, he wanted to. He felt a hard stare upon him. He glanced from the corner of his eye to its source. The Hokage was sitting there, outwardly unemotional, but in fact alert, waiting for any provocation. He knew that if he tried to jump down Sarutobi would be right on top of him, and although the other Kage wasn't the Yellow Flash, he was known as the God of Shinobi for a reason. He didn't want to find out the hard way which one of them was better. Idly, he wondered whether the other man was having trouble with his hips too. The Kazakage was seated between them, seemingly unconcerned, but in fact watching every twitch with maximum attention. The short man suppressed a sigh. He couldn't do anything now. But later. Later was a completely different matter. He leaned back in his seat, why do they make them so uncomfortable anyway? He wasn't getting any younger, and watched as the medics ran into the arena with an impassive expression. He'd wait for now. That was quite a fight, the Kazakage said. Too bad nobody would be advancing to the finals. Why so? The Hokage asked. Uzumaki would be all right by the time the final start. He was expressly forbidden from using the demon's chakra under the penalty of immediate disqualification, the Kazakage elaborated. Is that so? Sarutobi raised an eyebrow. I wasn't aware there was such a rule. I wasn't even aware that it was possible to make a rule specifically discriminating against one contestant. Everything is allowed, the Tsuchikage added. Such is the rule of the final matches. The Hokage was surprised. Just why did Oenoki help? 
he would expect him to hinder Naruto. He wants him to lose the finals, he realized. He hopes he would get killed and if not, he'd gain more information about his abilities. Should he allow it? Should he allow the Kazakage get away with a blatant disregard for the rules? It is what the exams are based upon, he said. Shouldn't a shinobi be prepared to face anything, a jinchuriki included? The Kazakage saw he was outnumbered. Very well, he decided. Uzumaki Naruto is allowed to continue. He turned to watch the arena floor. The only Suna semi-finalist was fighting next. After the debacle in the first round, he'd better win or Suna would look even weaker than it really was. Spectator stands, what was that? asked Kiba. Tsum knew what he wanted to know, but she couldn't answer. The law forbade it. She couldn't tell her son even this, but he demanded an answer and he wouldn't stop pestering her until she told him something. I'm not sure, she said. I think I've heard about a technique like that before, but it's been a long time ago. Technique? asked Kiba. It was quite something. I've never heard about anything like that. That's because you're still a pup, she answered. I'm already at the academy, mind you, he scowled. Some smiled inwardly. The conversation had been successfully steered away from dangerous themes. Isn't Hannah fighting next? Karamaru asked. She is, Tsum confirmed. The Inazuka trio turned their attention to the upcoming match, the last one forgotten. Finalists Booth Kuratsuchi watched in horror as her brother crumpled to the ground. Even though she had constantly teased him about being slow and thick, she recognized Akatsuchi as a strong and capable shinobi. She wasn't prepared to see him defeated, despite knowing what he was facing. She wanted to jump down and rip the little terror into pieces. Next round, she reminded herself. She just needed to advance to the final and then she could tear him legally. The only thing she had to do was defeat a purple Kanoha wench. No problem at all for an accomplished Kunoichi like her. She summoned what little patience she could find and waited. Both Hana and Hataru watched worriedly as Naruto was carried from the arena by Tenzo-sensei. They had seen enough proof of his healing ability, but this wound looked serious. That was close to the heart, the Inazuka said. Too bad she couldn't see where exactly the kunai had hit. I think if it failed to kill him on the spot, he'll be all right, Hataru said. I hope so, the brunette replied. And don't get depressed now, the purple-haired girl advised. You're next. Yes, the dog mistress nodded. Her dogs barked encouragingly. She smiled. You're right. Let's go and kick somebody's butt. That's the best remedy for depression. The second match of the semi-final, Genesuk of Suna against Inazuka Hana of Kanoha, Marushi called. Hana walked into the arena with a self-assured gait. She didn't actually feel that confident, her chakra was still low, but every one of hers and her dog's injuries were treated and she even found a bit of time to rest. The break between rounds had helped her immensely. But she wouldn't be doing another Garuga today, that was for sure. Genesuk entered the battlefield confidently as well. Removing all the honey from his and Uma proved to be harder than he had expected, but he finally managed when the previous match was halfway in. He had almost no time to rest, but he didn't mind. He hadn't really exerted himself during his own duel. He was running a bit low on poisons and drugs, they were hard to acquire for him, but he was sure he would manage. The proctor started the match and disappeared in a swirl of sand. Hannah didn't waste a moment. The instant the match begun she and her dog started forward. Genesuk moved his puppet into defensive position. The dogs jumped high overhead. The puppeteer hadn't expected it and the volley of Sunban missed them. The Suna Genin noticed something flying at him from the corner of his eye. He instinctively ducked, but was hit from the other side. He felt warmth seeping into his clothes. What the hell was that? He looked at the spot in alarm. It was yellowish in appearance. 
surely it can't be. A few steps away the Inazuka smirked. Dynamic air marking, successful. She knew enough about the puppet masters to expect him to try and hide himself or replace himself with a puppet. She saw his strategy in the previous match. He came into the arena as himself and concealed himself later on. It gave her an opening to make sure he won't be able to disappear on her. Genesuk just confirmed that the stuff on his robes was exactly what his initial assessment said. It indeed was dog piss. It pissed him of. How dare that bitch let her mutts piss on him. She was going down in the most painful and humiliating way, he was going to see to it. He turned around and searched for his opponent. He couldn't see her, just four of her dogs. There were only three of them, he realized, but which one of them is her? Never mind, I'll just take out all of them. He shot some more sunbon at them, but the dogs were fast and agile, avoiding every single one of his projectiles. Okay, time for the big guns, thought Genesuk. A part of him doubted it was wise to reveal his trump card so early in the game, but another told him that a card never played is like no card at all. The dog. Girl seemed to be a tough opponent, he wouldn't win if he'd hold back. He sent a command through his chakra strings. The sides of the horse-like puppet unfolded into a pair of giant wings. Hannah's eyes widened in surprise. So you see now why my puppet is called his Anuma, he laughed evilly. Behold the wings of despair. The puppet turned to face the four canines. Its wings were spread wide and the Inazukas could clearly see the Senban and Kunai launchers along them. If all of them fired at once, we'd be pincushions and there's no way to dodge it, the dog mistress thought. She briefly regretted not knowing a Dotan defensive jutsu. It could have saved her skin here. But she wasn't going to panic. There were other ways to deal with such threats. Gatsuga. Four furry tornadoes started after the sand ninja. The puppet released its weapons, but the needles couldn't find purchase on the rapidly spinning bodies and were batted away, only a handful of them piercing the skin. Genesuk's eyes widened at this. He performed a quick kawarimi to get away. It severed his connection with his Anuma. The puppet sagged before one tsuga slammed into its side. The construction flew away, splinters following like rain. Hannah appeared from the rubble, cursing and spitting dust. She scrambled to her feet and surveyed the results of the clash. Two of her dogs were lying on the ground, Senban protruding from their coats. It seemed the needles were poisoned and her partners were down for the count. She hoped fervently it was nothing lethal, but she was going to tear the Suna upstart a new one for this anyway. A wave of nausea hit her. She didn't escape unscatched herself. Damn, that was no good. She now had to wrap it up in under a minute. She called her last standing dog to her. She couldn't see their opponent, but it didn't matter. He was already marked and couldn't hide from her nose. It was now telling her that the puppeteer was behind a boulder to her left, digging himself into the sand. She started after him. Genesuk was fuming. Not only had that flea-infested bitch let her dogs piss on him, now she even broke his enuma. It would be a long time before he could repair it, not to mention the cost. Wood was expensive in the desert. A sound woke him up from his musings. That girl and one of her dogs were running at him. She knows where I am, he realized. For a moment panic threatened to overtake him, but he calmed quickly. There were things she obviously didn't know about puppeteers. His Anuma might have a hole in its side, but he was far from useless. He reconnected the chakra strings in an instant. Hannah was almost on top of her enemy, when her sensitive ears picked a disturbing sound. She shot a glance over her shoulder. The puppet was up again and charging at her. Ten kunai flew towards her, but she managed to dodge. She swore. Whatever poison got into her system earlier was spreading. The simple act of turning her head caused her an attack of vertigo. 
She had precious little time now and she couldn't waste it on some puppet. She had to go straight after its master and hope she'd get him sooner than the wooden horse gets her. She decided to gamble. She poured whatever chakra she had left into one last suga. She flew over the boulder and plunged headfirst into the ground. Genesuk was so startled by her reckless attack that he forgot to do a kawarimi until it was too late and he had no other way of dodging underground. The miniature tornado slammed into him. Hannah felt her claws dig into soft flesh. Warm blood flowed between her fingers. I got him, she thought. She tried to move, but she was too tired. Maybe she could take a nap. No, the match still wasn't called. She summoned all her remaining strength and pushed herself upwards. It wasn't the best idea. The vertigo came back with a vengeance. Stars flooded her field of vision. She slumped back to the ground, her world dissolving into darkness. Genesuk was in a world of pain. The attack hit him head on. He didn't even want to think about what would have happened had the layer of sand not been present to absorb most of the attack's force. Even now he felt like she broke all his ribs and tore the muscle from the bones. His armor did little to stop her, though he figured without it the damage would have been worse. He bit his lips to prevent himself from screaming and pushed the girl's body off of him. It gave him a lot more trouble than it should. He took a short break before the pain subsided a bit, then lifted himself into a sitting position. The brunette was lying next to him, the last dog licking her face frantically. She remained motionless. The canine then turned to him and bared its teeth in a threatening manner. It was going to attack, the Suna Genin just knew it. He had barely any strength left, but he still retained some of his equipment. With a flick of a wrist a small orb slid into his palm. He threw it at the dog, hitting its snout. The pouch exploded in a cloud of green smoke. The animal yelped in surprise, sneezed, swayed on its paws unsteadily and then fell over. The knockout gas took effect quickly. Genesuk wasn't affected only because he took the antidote before every battle he entered. He tried to stand, but he couldn't muster the necessary strength. He ended up just kneeling, leaning on his hands. The proctor appeared behind him and examined the downed Inazuka. Deciding she was indeed out, he called the match. Winner, Genesuk. The competitor in question just exhaled in relief. He immediately regretted it because his ribcage didn't agree with such sudden motion. Both Genin had to be carried off on a stretcher. It was bad. He didn't know whether he'd be able to fight in the final, but then, the winner of the previous match had to be carried off as well. Maybe he wouldn't be competing. Yes, that was it. He'll just wait and see what state the third finalist would end up in. After all, he would be facing. Just a little kid and a girl. He didn't need to move around to control his puppet. He tried to tell himself that it wouldn't be too tough. Spectators stands, Hannah. Kiba cried jumping from his seat. Hold back, some chastised him, but she herself was barely restraining herself from jumping down into the arena. She knew the Chunin exams were dangerous, shinobi life as a whole was dangerous, she had witnessed her fair share of injury and death, but seeing it happening to her own daughter was quite different. She could tell from experience that her wounds itself weren't serious, but there was no telling what kind of poison coated the puppeteer's weapons. She had fought in the Third Great Shinobi War and saw enough of Suna Puppet Master's handiwork. She could just pray that the boy didn't use anything lethal for the exams. She watched as the medics ran into the arena and started emergency treatment on both Genin before hauling them off. Kage Booth, very little finesse in this match, that Tsuchikage observed, but as a show of brute strength it was interesting. Too bad it looks like the winner wouldn't be able to fight in the final, the Hokage commented. A true puppeteer doesn't need to move to fight, the Kazakage replied. One of the Suna Genin advanced into the final and he would be fighting there, he was going to bully the medics personally to enable it. 
Having one contestant among the last three was at least a small remedy on the shame that were the quarterfinals. But he needs to hold his temper in check, Saratobi pointed out. The Kazakage could only grit his teeth. Finalists Booth Hataru watched with worry as her female teammate was carried off. When she saw how the usually so strong Inazuka fell quickly, she was deeply worried. She wanted to turn to somebody for comfort, but the only other occupant of the booth was her next opponent, who was looking at her in an unfriendly manner, mildly put. She understood the girl was upset because of her brother, but she didn't have to take it out on her. She'd like very much to beat the attitude out of the red-clad girl, but despite her decorative attire the IWA Kunoichi already proved to be capable. Hataru doubted she would be able to defeat her. Arena, the third math of the semi-finals, Yuzuki Hataru of Kanoha vs. Kuratsuchi of IWA, Marushi announced. The two combatants for the last semi-final match entered the arena with much anxiety. There was more at stake than in any of the previous matches. It didn't happen often for Akunoichi to win the Chunin exams tournament, almost never in fact, but now there was a real chance of it happening. Considering what state the previous two finalists were in when they were carried from the arena, if the winner of this one could walk away on her own two feet, she would be almost guaranteed to win even the next one. That is if the final battle would even happen. She might just win by default, but even that counted. And Kuratsuchi had one more. Reason to win. If she did, she would face the dreadful blonde boy who had hurt her brother so badly. She wasn't allowed to the infirmary and the doctors didn't tell her how he was, but that in itself meant something. Her dear little Akatsuchi was badly hurt and she was dead set on avenging him. She only needed to get through this wench. If she killed her in the process, it would just make her vengeance sweeter. The two girls stood facing each other, trying to intimidate the opponent. Hataru had to admit it was working. The IWA Kunoichi had shown a lot of strength in her first duel. The jutsu that covered half of the arena. She didn't know what she would do if she unleashed it on her. But then the black-haired girl won only with luck when the hit of her enemy's kanai unintentionally broke his genjutsu. And that Tsuchikage's granddaughter was Earth-type and she was Lightning. Lightning beat Earth in the elemental cycle. She was at advantage here. She wasn't going to lose to her. Databeo, as her young teammate would say. Marushi stood next to them. Ready? Begin, he signaled and disappeared from the arena. Hataru didn't have much of a strategy formed in her head. She simply charged her Kodachi with lightning chakra and ran in for an attack. Kuratsuchi just stood there unmoving. She just lifted her hands and performed hand seals. She's readying defense, Hataru thought. Let's see how it holds. She smirked and prepared to strike. Then some instinct warned her and she swerved to the side. She narrowly avoided being impaled on the other Kunoichi's kunai. Genjutsu, she realized. She made me think she didn't move. I have to be extra careful here. She brought her hands up in the dispelling sign. Kai, she whispered. Nothing happened. Did it mean that there was no other illusion or that the IWA girl was too good with them? Probably the first, decided Hataru. She seemed to have trouble with Daiki's genjutsu. She stayed on guard nevertheless. Kuratsuchi was mildly disappointed at the leaf girl saw through her illusion so quickly. She had hoped to finish this fight soon, conserving her energy for the finals, but now it seemed like she would have to actually work for her victory. Ah, well, never mind. She always enjoyed a good challenge. The Kanoha girl was charging her sword with lightning chakra again. Kuratsuchi decided that she definitely didn't want to be hit with this. She would have to keep the fight long distance. She ran her hands through a series of seals and then stomped down forcibly. A fissure appeared in the ground and headed straight for the purple-haired girl. Hataru jumped to the side. Kuratsuchi smirked and with another hand sign released a second jutsu. 
Hataru's feet touched the ground and sank in. Then she turned into a boulder. Kuratsuchi's smirk disappeared. She really hated Kawarimi, especially when it meant her victims escaping. She jumped to the side as well. It turned out to be a wise decision, since the place she had been standing on was showered by lightning bolts. She turned around and threw a handful of kunai at the swords girl. She evaded nimbly. Kuratsuchi made a seal and activated the exploding tags. Hataru was thrown forward and changed into a rock. Did Kuratsuchi already mention she hated the Kawarimi? She jumped to the side again. This time the lightning grazed her leg and made her stumble. Not good, she thought. This hit wasn't serious, but she couldn't afford to sustain any more. She needed to hit the leaf kunoichi first, but she was too good at dodging. She needed a wide area technique that didn't leave anywhere to dodge. She had tried the stone rose garden once before, but she thought she could get better results now her mind wasn't clouded by some freaky ability. Hataru jumped high when the ground under her feet shifted. She looked down and saw stone vines sprouting from the sand, every one of them bearing sharp-looking thorns. A quick glance showed that most of the arena was affected. Dodging wasn't an option anymore. She quickly sheathed her blade and ran through the hand seals. She had to finish the Jutsu Airborne, or she would be in a world of trouble. She made it just in time. Lightning sprang from her fingers, hitting in a perfect circle right under her. The stone roses in the target area were destroyed. Hataru landed on safe ground. It didn't stay safe for long. Kuratsuchi pulled more chakra into her technique and soon roses appeared even in the burnt circle. That's bad, thought Hataru. How long can she keep it up anyway? Her blade crackled with lightning again. She attacked. She ran forward slashing at the stone vines left and right. They tried to ensnare her, but she kept dodging and evading. Some thorns managed to scratch her legs, but she paid it no heed. Kuratsuchi realized her strategy wasn't working. The leaf girl was closing in on her. She ran her hands through another series of seals and slammed them into the ground. Hataru noticed too late that the roses around her started crumbling. She looked up in surprise, guessing where the next attack would come from. That's when she felt the ground soften under her feet. She jumped before the quicksand could entrap her and performed a kawarimi. She thought herself safe for a moment, but Kuratsuchi had guessed correctly where she would appear. Kunai with explosive tags were almost upon her, the notes already burning. She made a great leap sideways and released the chakra from her blade in one burst. It wasn't much in the way of defense, but it protected her from the blast somewhat. Instead of being knocked out she was just burned and struggling to catch her breath. Kuratsuchi threw more kunai. Hataru mustered the strength needed for another kawarimi. This time the IWA Kunoichi's guess of her next location was off and the purple-haired girl gained a few seconds to haul herself to her feet. Her reprieve didn't last long. She saw Kuratsuchi running at her with kunai in both. Hands. She smiled grimly. If close combat was what the rock girl wanted, she would get some. Hataru was good at this. Just when she was about to cleave the other girl in half, she noticed something odd. Her feet didn't leave footprints, but some were appearing about a step to the left. Another genjutsu, Hataru realized. But now I know where she is. She struck the air above the phantom footsteps. Her blade passed right through. What? Her body reacted on its own. She started dodging. She didn't make it, but the kunai just slid along her rib instead of plunging between them. The genjutsu was broken. The footprints disappeared and appeared exactly where the red-clad girl had passed through. Kuratsuchi grimaced. This was one of her better genjutsu and she had hoped to gain a more decisive result than this. Sure, her opponent was now clutching the side of her chest, but she was still in the game. The black-haired girl barely avoided another lightning bolt. 
she couldn't afford to drag this fight much longer. All the techniques she pulled so far cost her too much chakra, so no more ninjutsu today. She reached into her pouch. She still had a couple of blast notes left. Now just how to make sure they'd hit. She could try another genjutsu, but the pain the Kanoha Kunoichi was in would disrupt it quickly. Hataru was having similar thoughts. She was wounded, bleeding, and tired to boot. She had to land a finishing blow before she dropped with exhaustion. She gathered her strength and ran at her opponent in a straight line. Kuratsuchi tensed. She prepared her kanai to strike. The other girl wasn't using lightning chakra anymore, so she could fight her close up. When the purple-clad girl was almost upon her, she sidestepped. Hataru's kodachi missed her narrowly. She stabbed with her kunai. It hit the other girl's torso with a sound of metal hitting rock. Not another kawarimi, she thought exasperatedly. She whirled around to see where the kanoha kunoichi was now. The movement made her head swim. I must be more tired than I thought, she realized. She spotted the other girl running at her again, this time with blade crackling with yellow light. She threw a couple of shuriken at her. The purple-haired girl didn't even bother to dodge, the projectiles went wide. Since when do I have such a bad aim? Kuratsuchi wondered. Then it struck her. Kai. The word instantly spun before coming back into focus. A direction skewering genjutsu, she realized. She must have cast it when I turned around, that was what the vertigo meant. If I hadn't thrown the shuriken, I wouldn't have noticed it until too late. But she didn't have time to consider the might have beans. Once Hataru realized her ploy had fallen, she lunged together with a desperate burst of speed and unleashed the lightning from her blade. Only a last moment Kawarimi saved Kuratsuchi from being fried. Hataru lost her balance and fell. She had given her everything to that last attack and it failed. The wound on her rib seriously affected the mobility on her right arm and though the blood loss wasn't that bad in itself, combined with the exhaustion it was enough to make her feel lightheaded. She scrambled to her feet. On the other side of the arena Kuratsuchi was doing the same. Her kawarimi was almost too late and a few bolts had electrocuted her. It was all she could do not to lose concentration and finish the technique. It occurred to her that she might lose the fight. No, she thought, loss was plain unacceptable. Not if it would mean she'd lose her chance at avenging Akatsuchi as well. She didn't think of what good would she do in her current state. She mustered all her remaining strength and cast a genjutsu on her still disoriented opponent. Hataru didn't notice anything wrong. She just saw Kuratsuchi limping towards her, a pair of kunai in her hands. She assumed the basic kenjutsu stance, or the best approximation her sore body allowed. She waited for her opponent to come closer. Just a little longer, she was almost at striking distance now. Hataru felt a kunai touch her ribs. With speed she didn't know she was still capable of she fell backwards. The blade pierced her nevertheless but the wound wasn't deep enough to be life-threatening. The IWA Kunoichi towered above her, the bloodied weapon in her hand coupled with her blood-red clothes and the expression in her eyes made her look like a goddess of wrath. Hataru swung her kodachi, but Kuratsuchi easily avoided. She tried to charge her sword with lightning again, but her strength was leaving her rapidly along with the blood flowing from her veins. Her opponent looked like she wanted to kill her. Scratch it, she really wanted to kill her, the purple-clad girl realized as she barely blocked a stab. The kick to her wounded ribs she couldn't block. It made her cough up blood. There was just one way out of the situation in her mind. I yield, she called between the coughs. Kuratsuchi ignored it and attacked again. Hataru didn't have enough strength to block anymore, but she managed to deflect the kanai from her heart to her shoulder. Marushi appeared in the arena. The match is over, he called. Winner, Kuratsuchi. The IWA Kunoichi readied for another strike. 
the proctor caught her arm. I said the fight is over. Do you want to be disqualified? No, she didn't want that. Not before she got her hands on the blonde bastard. She released her grip on the handle. The kunai fell to the ground, scratching Hataru's leg on its way down. The purple-haired kunoichi barely noticed. She was halfway unconscious by the time. Kuratsuchi gave her one last glance. She would have liked to kick her around some more, but not for the price of forfeiting her chance to avenge her brother. She turned on her heel and headed for the infirmary. Kage booth this was a good fight, the Kazakage observed. Both combatants showed strategy and skill. Today shinobi often forget the value of Genjutsu. Indeed, the Hokage agreed. They both showed great potential and I would vote for both of them, if it wasn't for the end of the match. Your granddaughter attacked her downed opponent even after the match was called. Such disobedience isn't tolerated in a chunin. She was distraught over the injury of her brother, the Tsuchikich said. That isn't an excuse, Sarutobi pointed out. Doesn't she know Rule 25? Oanoki didn't answer. The professor was right as usual. Shinobi couldn't afford to let their emotions hinder them, he taught it to his grandchildren himself. An IWA ninja must have a heart of stone, he told them countless times. That didn't change the fact he wanted to rip a certain Kanoha genin to pieces with his bare hands. But he had earned the title of Tsuchikij for a reason. He was patient. He would wait for the best opportunity and then strike with deadly efficiency. The wait would just make his revenge that much sweeter. The infirmary he visited his grandson in the infirmary again. It seemed like it was everything he was doing during the breaks this exams. It was disturbing. But this time Akatsuchi wasn't joking around, boasting how he was going to squish his next opponent. He was lying motionlessly on his back, his tanned skin now ashen, almost as pale as the sheets. Kuratsuchi was sitting by his side, holding his hand. She stood up when he entered, but he motioned her to sit back down. A medic was nearby, checking the patient's vitals. How is he? the Oanoki asked. He is stable now, Tsuchikich-sama, the woman replied. His wounds are deep and that strange chakra that inflicted them makes them hard to heal. Fortunately none of them had hit a vital organ, otherwise. But that isn't the worst problem. As he impacted with the wall, his skull has been cracked. We managed to stop the bleeding to the brain, but there was a bone fragment we are unable to remove. He's in a coma and we cannot tell when he'll wake. If he will wake. A heavy silence permeated the room. The midget man once more couldn't believe his ears. His cute little grandson, always so lively, getting into mischief, was lying there so still and the medic was telling him he would stay that way. It was just too much to bear. He had already lost his son, and now he was facing losing another one. I will kill him for sure, Kuratsuchi said. Her wounds were mild and the mednin finished treating them already. No, he stopped her. That one is strong. You saw what he did to your brother. I don't want to lose you too. You won't, the girl assured him. You know I'm better than Red. Besides that little brat is exhausted and wounded. You saw they had to carry him from the arena. Maybe he won't even be in the final? Maybe, but don't count on it, he chided. He's resilient, that much I could gather. And you aren't at your full strength now. Kuratsuchi, be careful. Aren't I always, the Kunoichi smirked. Do you really want me to answer? It, the old man asked in return. Kill him if you can, but don't risk yourself. We can always get him later should you fail. The infirmary Naruto slowly opened his eyes. He didn't recognize the room he was in, but the smell told him beyond a doubt that it was a hospital. The voices of nurses were another clue. He realized he was awoken when the door opened and slammed into the wall. Two nurses were pushing a wheeled bed in. Atop it Hannah was lying, clearly unconscious. 
Hannah, he called. The nurses looked at him in surprise. You're awake already, one of them asked in a disbelieving tone. Yes, he answered sitting up. You should be resting, she admonished him. Why? I'm all right, he claimed, even though he felt a bit under the weather. Well, more than a bit under the weather, but that didn't mean he had to stay in a hospital. Let the doctors decide that, the nurse declared. Naruto scowled at her. I'm fine. Then his eyes find Hannah's still form on the bed. What happened to her? She lost her match, the woman explained. It's nothing serious, just some paralyzing agent on the needles, but it took the medics a while to get the right antidote. She just needs time to get it out of her system. She's much better off than your other teammate. What's with Hataru? Naruto asked alarmed. She lost her match as well, the nurse briefed him. The IWA girl did quite a number on her. How is she, the blonde demanded. I don't know, the nurse shrugged. She is still in the surgery. Naruto hopped off the bed. And just where do you think you are going, young man, the woman scowled. Naruto ignored her. Ignoring scowling people had become second nature to him a long time ago. The other nurse whispered something into her ear urgently. Naruto didn't catch it all, but there was something about Gara. The first nurse paled and tried to make herself invisible. Naruto ran past her, paying it no heed. In the hallway he almost ran into Hannah's mother and her little brother. Sorry, he stammered. Nothing happened, some replied. I just wanted to see Hataru. Do you know how she is? Sorry, but I don't know, the Inazuka matriarch answered. Hey, how comes you're up? Kiba asked. What? Weren't you hurt? the dark-haired boy questioned. Oh that? It wasn't as bad as it looked, Naruto tried to brush it aside. It looked pretty bad from where I was, Kiba argued. Some didn't like the direction the conversation was heading and decided to change it. You shouldn't bother him, Kiba. Naruto has to go to the final. You wouldn't want him to be disqualified for being late because of you? The final? Naruto didn't understand. But he said if I. Well, the Inazuka clan had interrupted, they announced you are in the last match. Really? But. They would let me sleep through it. Anger and horror waged a war on his face. Sorry, gotta go. Bye. And he ran off to the arena. Kage booth, so the last match is about to start. The Kazakage remarked, and it's the best of Suna against the best of IWA. That it is, that Suchikage agreed. Too bad that yours champion didn't show up, Sarutobi Dano, Oanoki said, a smirk carefully hidden in his voice. There was nothing better for the aged Kage than getting one up over Kanoha. It is, the Hokage agreed, but he is still young. He would have plenty of chances in the upcoming years. There wasn't a trace of disappointment in the professor's voice. In fact, Sarutobi was secretly pleased with himself. He managed to put the Kazakage into his place by preventing him from disqualifying Naruto while the Tsuchikage's plans would be disrupted by the simple fact that the boy wouldn't be fighting in the final match because he was lying in the infirmary unconscious. He watched as the proctor called for the participants to come down and the IWA girl and the Suna boy took their places in the middle of the arena. Then Naruto came running from a side door and stood beside them. Crap. The best laid plans. The arena he made it just in time. Both Kuratsuchi and Genesuk were already waiting and the proctor was about to start the fight without him. Kuratsuchi looked beaten up, but she was standing on her own. Genesuk's condition was hard to assess under his clothing, but he was sitting on his anuma and his breathing sounded strained. Girls must have put up quite a fight, Naruto thought. So nice of you to show up, Marushi commented sarcastically. We were about to start without you. Sorry, Naruto apologized. My sensei was so worried for my teammates that he forgot to wake me up. 
whatever. Now you're finally up, we can begin, the proctor said. The rules for the three-way match are following, anything goes. If somebody is unconscious, he's out. If I decide somebody cannot continue the fight, I can declare him out. Whoever yields is out. The last one standing is the winner. Understood? The three genin nodded. Well, then final match, Huzumaki Naruto of Konoha, Genosuke of Suna and Kuratsuchi of IWA, begin. And he disappeared from the arena. Kuratsuchi wasted no time and ran her hands through seals. She didn't want to drag this battle needlessly and most importantly she didn't want to face two opponents at once. She planned to take out the weaker one of them first, and she decided it was Genesuk. The puppeteer was barely holding himself upright on his horse-like puppet. The San Genin wasn't idle as well. He knew his wounds could reopen any time and then he would pass out of blood loss. He had to act quickly. He commanded his Anuma to spread its wings. He didn't have the time and energy to refill all the hidden compartments, but it would have to do. He sent hails of poison Sunban on both his opponents. Naruto knew he'd have to act quickly. The IWA Kunoichi was out for his blood and he couldn't count on getting any help from the Suna puppeteer. He'd hate having to fight both of them at once. Going after the wounded. One first was a logical choice. When the Senban launched, he was already moving. He didn't dodge, instead he created a wind shield. The Senban were blown away harmlessly. He performed another series of hand seals. Futon, great breakthrough, was his jutsu of choice. He figured that if he managed to knock the Suna Genin down, the pain from his injuries would incapacitate him. Genesuk realized it as well. He escaped via a Kawarimi before Naruto's technique could hit. He didn't have time to look where the puppeteer had disappeared to. A flicker of movement in the corner of his eye had warned him of Kuratsuchi's approach. He turned to face her, drawing his sword, charging it with wind chakra. The air moved against his skin in a way it wasn't supposed to. He jumped back and slashed his blade at the area he suspected the disturbance originated from. He was rewarded by a hiss of pain, before the genjutsu making Kuratsuchi appear a step away from where she really was disappeared. He didn't have time to assess how badly he wounded her, a swish of kunai sailing through the air reminded him there was one more opponent still in the game. He switched with a boulder. He turned around to survey the situation. Kuratsuchi was in the middle of the arena, dodging Senban, bleeding from a shallow cut across her stomach. Genesuk was nowhere to be seen, but his Anuma was running towards the IWA girl, firing his poisoned weapons. The puppet was badly battered, but it was still moving, despite splinters falling from the dry wood from time to time. That can be exploited, Naruto decided. Despite feeling down on Chakra, he created a shadow clone. He waited for the horse-like device to move into the right position and then unleashed his favorite wind-fire combo. The puppet tried to escape, but not before it was caught by the raging flames. It was charred and smoking, but didn't catch on fire. Crap, Naruto thought. There must be fire-suppressing seals on it. So he had just spectacularly wasted a lot of chakra and a rustle of sand alerted him to Kuratsuchi's approach. He unsheathed his ninjato and prepared to face her. The kunoichi threw some kunai at him. He dodged easily. He ran forward to engage her in close combat. Then he was thrown off his feet by the exploding tag wrapped around one of the kunai. He stumbled and the girl was quick to exploit it. He managed to block her kunai stab, but she kicked him in the stomach. He fell backwards. He tried to stab her but she evaded nimbly. Then she looked at something over his head and her eyes widened momentarily. Naruto used the time to pull of a kawarimi. It was a wise choice. The area they have been in was sprayed by Senban, courtesy of his Anuma. The third player in the match sure was bothersome. Naruto decided to find where Genesuk was hiding and take him out before dealing with Kuratsuchi. 
he couldn't see neither hair nor hide of him, so he decided to sniff him out. He was no Inazuka, but his nose was quite sensitive and the puppeteer was bleeding. He could always pick the smell of blood easier than any other. The problem was that his wasn't the only blood spilled here today. Naruto tasted the air carefully and he almost had a direction. Then Kuratsuchi flung a kunai with exploding tag at him and he was forced to evade. He lost the track of Genesuk. Fighting two people at once sure was becoming an even bigger bother with each passing minute. Naruto reached into his pouch and took out his own kunai with exploding tags. He was running low on them, but he had enough to blast both his opponents into smithereens, if he only could hit them. It was too bad he didn't have another wire net, but they were too hard to make and seal properly. He threw the kunai at Kuratsuchi in his anuma, tags already activated. The girl performed a quick kawarimi, the puppet made a giant leap away. There were twin explosions of light and thunder. When they cleared, Naruto was nowhere to be seen. He did that trick in the first round, the IWA Kunoichi thought, but I haven't caught how does it work. And more importantly, where is he? She surveyed her surrounding, keeping an eye for the elusive Kanoha Genin. She decided to deal with the puppeteer before she would go looking for him. Genesuk observed the ground from his hiding spot. He as well didn't know how Naruto's disappearing trick worked, but he was experienced in stealth enough to guess what the youngest of the finalists would try to do. He kept his eyes open for any sign of Naruto's approach. And then he saw it. A small lizard was making its way across the sand. He smirked. That particular kind of lizards didn't live in this area. And even if they did, they would have ran from the arena as soon as the first match started. Genesuk smirked. Such were the advantages of fighting on home ground. He aimed one of his Anuma Sanban launchers and fired. He hit his target perfectly. The lizard disappeared in a cloud of smoke, leaving a kunai with an explosive tag behind. Crap, a clone, Genesuk thought. Where is the real one? And how many blast notes did he place around? And where exactly? He wished he knew or at least had more time to find out, but Kuratsuchi chose that moment to attack. The Kunoichi had dredged up her last reserves of chakra and turned the ground under his anuma into quicksand. The puppeteer tried to get his puppet away from the danger, but the ground solidified, trapping the wooden horse's hooves. Genesuk swore inwardly. This wasn't good, but it wasn't hopeless either. He fired a volley of kunai at the girl forcing her to dodge where the kunai with the explosive tag was lying. He hoped Naruto would activate it, taking her out that way. Kuratsuchi realized she was in deep trouble. The last technique had drained her of almost all her remaining chakra and stars appeared in her vision. But even through them she could still see the trap laid on the ground. A kawarimi would be a perfect solution, but she didn't think she had the energy anymore. I mustn't lose here, I must avenge Akatsuchi, she repeated, but it failed to give her any more strength. She jumped away from the kunai and rolled on the ground near where the explosive tag laid. She saw it burst into flames. She forced her legs to move and leapt. Somehow she managed to get behind a boulder before the tag went off. The blast only scorched the skin on her arm and leg. The pain nearly made her faint anyway. She lay on the ground trembling, waiting for it to subside. Naruto sighed in relief. The puppeteer had made his job easier, the homicidal IWA girl was out. The puppet was trapped. Now only if he could find its master and the match would be his. He grabbed his last two kunai with blast notes. Despite his high stamina and fast restoring of chakra reserves, he was running on his last leg here. He should refrain from using jutsu if possible. He jumped out of his hiding spot, sword in one hand, kunai in the other. He would try to place the blast notes inside the puppet through the hole Hana had made with her tsuga earlier. The puppet started firing its deadly projectiles. Naruto dodged what he could, blocked what he couldn't. It was tricky, 
but fortunately he didn't have to get far, just into position for a good throw. Then too many projectiles to block were flying at him. He screamed. The current of chakra-laced air blew the kunai away from him. It also lifted a large cloud of dust. Naruto threw a couple of kunai with handles wrapped in paper through it. Genosuke used his Anuma's wing to bat them away. Naruto took a deep breath and pumped what little chakra he still had left to his legs. He sprinted through the dust cloud. Smoke bombs exploded around him and he suspected that bad things would happen to whoever inhaled the greenish gas. Fortunately he took a deep breath beforehand. He came to expect such tricks from Suna Shinobi. He was almost upon the horse. The wing lifted again, trying to reach him. Naruto dropped low and threw another set of kunai with paper tags on them. His Anuma unleashed a volley of sunban at him. It hit only the rock Naruto exchanged himself with. Two explosive notes were already smoking on its surface. Genosuke realized he was in deep trouble. He was hiding inside his puppet, which was trapped and two blast notes were about to go off in close vicinity. But he was a true puppeteer, which meant he had always more tricks up his sleeves. A command unhinged the joints on his Anuma's leg. The puppet leapt away, the shorter limbs making it harder, but it still managed to cover a fair distance before the explosion reached it. The intensity of the blast was diminished, but even the weak hit made his injured ribs hurt. He had to stop his movement and wait for the burning pain in his chest to lessen. Naruto was about to congratulate himself for a job well done, when he noticed something on the ground next to his feet, namely a burning explosive tag. His eyes widened for a moment and he jumped backwards with all his might and threw his arms in front of his face. There wasn't enough time for a kawarimi. How, was the only thought in his head before the explosion threw him into the air. He tried to roll in the air in order to land on his feet, but the blast completely disoriented him. He landed on his back painfully, his breath knocked out. Kuratsuchi smiled grimly. She had gathered her bearings after the hit in time to see the blonde Kanoha menace place the explosive notes on the rock. He was completely ignoring her, thinking she was down for the count. She let him think so. When he left the rock and charged for the trapped puppet, she took out her own blast notes and threw them close to the tagged rock. Let the brat taste his own medicine. When he inevitably switched with the boulder, she activated the tags remotely. She watched with satisfaction as the yellow menace flew through the air and landed with a thud. Now was her time to finish him. She got to her feet and limped towards her downed opponent. Infirmary Tenzo waited for the medics to finish their work on Hataru. Of all his three students, she was the worst off. The medics didn't even tell him her prognosis. From what he saw before she was hauled to the surgery, he gathered her wounds weren't fatal, but that was about it. Then the door finally swung open and the doctors wheeled the bed with the still unconscious Hataru out. How is she? he asked. She will be fine, one medic answered. None of the wounds hit anything vital and we were able to reconnect all the torn muscle. It will take a couple of weeks, but she will be back to full health. Tenzo released the breath he had been holding. At least all of his team would be fine. He followed his wounded student to where her teammates were resting. Or they were supposed to. When he entered the room, he saw Hannah sleeping on the bed, her mother and brother and their dogs in attendance, but no little blonde-haired boys. Where is Naruto? he asked alarmed. He ran out of here like his backside was on fire, some replied. What? Tenzo didn't understand. He had to hurry or he'd miss the final, the Inazuka clan had elaborated. What? The Mokutan wielder couldn't believe his ears. But he wasn't supposed to. I don't know what he was or wasn't supposed to, but he certainly went there, the dog woman shrugged. That hothead, the Jounin sensei whined. Then he realized he was on the wrong spot and ran to the arena. What he saw nearly made his heart stop. Arena floor Naruto's ears were ringing. There were black spots in front of his eyes. 
His lungs were burning, struggling for the much-needed air. His body simply hurt. That was usually the time the QB would make itself known, taunting him for his weakness, sending his chakra to heal and strengthen him, but the wicked Kitsune remained stubbornly silent. He was on his own. He had to move, he was now sitting duck four. Whoever got him with the blast notes. He hefted himself into a sitting position. It hurt like nobody's business and it nearly made him faint, but his vision cleared a little. He looked around and spotted the red-clad Kunoichi wobbling towards him. Wasn't she out, he wondered. He didn't have time to ponder over it. She was getting closer, the kunai in her hands glittering ominously. He had to do something quickly, which was hard considering how much trouble he had moving. He took a deep breath, desperately struggling to concentrate, to push whatever chakra he had into the air and change it to wind element. It was so hard, there was no way he could make it in time. Kuratsuchi was just a couple of steps away, looking like an angel of death. He briefly considered forfeiting, but he suspected the IWA Kunoichi wouldn't care about it. He screamed. His control was slipping. The blast of chakra-laced wind had blown the Kunoichi off her feet, but it failed to hurt her seriously. And to make matters worse Naruto tasted blood in his mouth and his lungs felt cut up from inside. The boy could only hope this wasn't what really happened, he hadn't botched this technique that badly in months. He coughed up blood. Where is the no good excuse for a kitsune when I need him, he thought. Does he have a limit on healing one serious injury a day or what? He struggled to remain conscious. He noticed Kuratsuchi trying to get up, but the gravitation was winning. This was slowly turning into a contest who could take more damage. And where was Genesuk? He surveyed his surroundings. He noticed the puppet moving again, spreading its wings to unleash another volley of deadly projectiles. I cannot stay here, he realized. He dredged up what little chakra he still had and ran his hands through the seals of the Kawarimi. He didn't need those to perform the jutsu for a long time, but he couldn't risk anything going wrong now. He made it in time. He reappeared on the other side of the stadium and had perfect view of Kuratsuchi's startled face when she heard the needles approaching. She was facing away from his Anuma and she noticed the danger too late. She had only time enough to cover her face before the Senban hit. Naruto watched the IWA Kunoichi collapse. Despite his previous bad experience, he was sure she was truly out of the game now. It was only him and the puppeteer now. He was wounded, exhausted, out of exploding tags and very low on weapons. He still had his trusty ninjato, but he wasn't sure whether he retained the strength to wield it. This is a good time to yield, he thought, but he refrained. Partly because he hoped Genesuk was even worse off, partly out of sheer stubbornness. The Kanoha Genin was right when he reckoned Genesuk had trouble as well. When the blast notes had hit the Hizanuma, it had caused his wounds to reopen. He could feel the blood trickling down his stomach. He had no idea how much he had lost, but he was already feeling. Lightheaded. It was all he could do to maintain the chakra strings necessary to operate the puppet. He commanded his Anuma to turn around and run towards the enemy. The shorter legs made its movement slow and awkward, but it couldn't stop him. The Kanoha Genin looked unable to get to his feet. One volley of kunai was everything that was needed to take him out now, but Genesuk's vision was swimming and he couldn't trust it to tell him the correct location of his target. He had to get close and launch a wide area attack. He still had enough sunban for that. Naruto tried to get up, but ended up having another coughing fit. I have really cut up my lungs, he thought. What is the damned fuzzball doing? Why isn't he healing me? Does he want me to die here or what? Out of the corner of his eye he noticed movement. The puppet was nearing towards him. The blood dripping from its underside betrayed its master's location. At least I know where he is. I might take him out with one hit, if I give it all I have. A part of his mind told him that was overly optimistic, 
bordering on idiotic, but he decided to ignore it. He wasn't giving up, period. When he couldn't breathe, it meant he had to do it without breathing. He lifted a shaky hand to his sword handle and managed to grab it on the second try. He unsheathed the blade and forced his last dregs of chakra into it. Concentrate, sharpen it, change it into wind, he thought. He wasn't sure how successful he was. He stood up, not sure where he got the energy necessary for that action and not caring. He started running, lifting his ninjato for a strike. Genesuk saw his opponent charging. He was startled. If he still has so much energy, I have to finish him now. He commanded the launchers to fire. Only half of them went off, and most of the projectiles went wide. My control is slipping, realized the puppeteer with a start. He quickly reconnected the strings controlling the kunai launchers. That made him turn his attention away from the strings commanding the movement of the puppet. His anuma stumbled, making Genesuk hit his wounded ribcage painfully. He hissed in pain. He regained the lost balance, but by that time Naruto was almost upon him, swinging his sword down. A number of Senban were protruding from his body, but he paid them no mind. The expression on his face made the Suna Genin fear for his life. He wanted to fire another batch of Kanai at him, but he was a split second too slow. Naruto's blade hit. The wood of his Anuma was reinforced against damage, but the simple seals Genesuk could afford could do only so much. Naruto's attempt at sharpening his sword with wind chakra wasn't completely successful, but it was enough to cut through the outer shell of the puppet. It cleaved into the puppeteer's shoulder before coming to a stop. Oddly enough, there was no pain, only the shock of the blade entering his body made him release the hold on the chakra strings. His anuma collapsed, well. Like a puppet with cut strings. Genesuk noticed the blonde boy collapsing as well, before the ground met him forcibly, sending him into the realm of unconsciousness. Marushi shunshined into the arena and carefully checked all three combatants. All of them were out of it and neither looked like he would wake any time soon. The final match is over. Neither of the combatants is able to continue. There is no winner. Spectator stands Tenzo barely restrained himself long enough for the proctor to announce the result of the match. He jumped down onto the arena sand even before the medical team could get there. Once again his young charge was lying motionless on the ground. This time he couldn't tell how severe his wounds were, but he reckoned they were nothing to be laughed off. He knelt beside his downed student. One look at him was enough to tell him what happened. Once again Naruto had overdone it. There were Sanban piercing his body, making him look like a pincushion. The blood on his lips hinted at internal injury, whether inflicted by an enemy or gain due to miscast jutsu he was unable to tell. Oh, Naruto, he whispered. What have you done to yourself now? Excuse me, sir. Tenzo lifted his head to se what was speaking. It was one of the medics. We have to treat him now and take him to the infirmary. He nodded. The Mednans lifted Naruto on a stretcher and carried him out of the arena. Tenzo took one last look around. The geisha lookalike was kneeling in the sand, helping the medics pry her student out of his puppet. He idly wondered how her expensive kimono would look like after the ordeal. Then he followed the procession. Kage booth, now that was something, the Kazakage remarked. I don't remember there ever being a three-way knockout in the matches. Even two-way ones are rare. That's true, the Hokage nodded. The fighters had to be strongly motivated to continue even wounded. They seemed that way, the Kazakage agreed. And they showed good strategy as well, the Tsuchikage added. Indeed, the Hokage nodded. It's how they got that far, after all. The Kazakage was disappointed. He had hoped so much that one of his would win the tournament. He knew the chances were low when he saw how badly was Genesuk wounded, but he had hoped nevertheless. Now his champion was lying unconscious in the sand, stuck inside his puppet. 
that nobody else was declared the winner was only a small consolation. He shot a glance to where the wind country daimyo was seated. There he was, a once handsome young man now turned overweight due to years of inactivity. The Kazakage imagined that he would be overflowing with fat in a couple of years, a huge glob of grease covered by expensive robes and scented by rare perfumes, feasting on exotic treats, whose price would be enough to run Suna for months. He had trouble restraining himself from gritting his teeth aloud. He detested the man like no one else in the whole world. It was utterly humiliating that he had to obey such a man. He was certain that every Suna shinobi felt that way. Unfortunately there was nothing he could do about it. He quickly averted his gaze. It would help nothing if the daimyo suspected him of insubordination. Oanoki had watched the whole battle with worry. He had half hoped that the blonde demon wouldn't show up, it would have meant losing their chance at finishing him off legally, but it also lessened the danger for Kuratsuchi. Despite having faith in his granddaughter's abilities, he realized that the Kanoha Jinchuriki wouldn't be killed that easily. He could see what wound had Akatsuchi given him and how fast it had closed. One moment he had hoped that his granddaughter would make it, but he was also worried about the blonde menace releasing his demon. He didn't know whether to feel relieved or disappointed when Kuratsuchi was hit by the puppeteer's senban. He only hoped that whatever coated them wasn't lethal. But another plan of dealing with the problem formed in his mind. He bid the necessary goodbyes to the other Kage and made his way to where his grandchildren were being treated. He had some orders to give. VIP Booth Gara stood up and walked out without a word, to the relief of Kankuro. Tamari watched him worriedly. Her youngest brother didn't utter a single word during the course of the finals and it was impossible to tell what he was thinking. She had been scared when she saw the Kanoha Jinchuriki unleash his power. It felt even worse than Shikaku's. She thought he would for sure turn upon them and rip them to shreds, but nothing like that happened. The sinister red power dwindled down and disappeared. He watched as the small boy was carried out of the arena by his sensei. She felt oddly touched. What would have happened if somebody did this for Gara? And now, in the next fight, the blonde boy didn't use the power at all even if it would have granted him a victory. Why? She had no idea. Instead he was now lying motionless and it seemed incomprehensible that he could have defeated such a powerhouse as Gara. What did her crazy brother think about it? Would he revert back to his old ways? Would he try to kill the other demon vessel while he was down and defenseless? She didn't know. She probably should have followed him but she was still too scared of him. Infirmary Gara walked through the halls unhindered. Whatever medical personnel was around, they scattered and hid upon seeing him. He had still the reputation of a murdered. There was nobody he could ask directions, but he didn't need to. The voice of Shikaku in his head was everything he needed. It led him towards an inconspicuous door. A single man was standing in front of it. He eyed the redhead warily, but didn't run. Mother demanded his blood, but Gara ignored her voice. I came to see Naruto, the tattooed youth said. The doctors don't allow anybody in while they're working, Tenzo answered. How is he? The Suna. Jinchuriki's voice was completely flat. I'm not sure about the extent of his injuries, the wood user replied, but he's exhausted. He wouldn't be waking any time soon. Why didn't he simply crush his opponents? I know he could. That was something the youngest of Kazakage's children couldn't comprehend. The Kazakage threatened to disqualify him if he used his tenant's power, the Kanoha ninja explained. And he obeyed? Gara certainly wouldn't have. He didn't want to cause trouble, Naruto's sensei answered. Hn. The tattooed boy tried to process the information. Was there anything else you wanted? Tenzo didn't want to show it, but he was nervous in the redhead's presence and couldn't wait for him to leave. No. He then turned and left, leaving a very relieved Leaf Jounin in his wake. 
Outside the arena two figures were making their way through the streets of Sunagakir. Those were quite some fights, the taller one commented. They were only children, the shorter and wider one disagreed. True, his companion nodded, but couldn't you see their potential? Maybe in one or two of them, the squat man shrugged. But the situation as a whole shows a lot of potential as well, doesn't it? The evil smile was palpable in the taller man's voice. Don't get ahead of yourself, the shorter figure chided. We have a plan, remember. That I do, the leaner figure nodded, but shouldn't plans be changed if the circumstances call for it? It's not our place to change the plans, the wider figure chided. You have no imagination, the taller man waved his arm around in a dramatic gesture. There are so many possibilities in the air today. Surely nobody would fault us for taking them. The other figure just shrugged. Your funeral. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.